Great. Okay, the pastoral epistles. Um, First and Second Timothy and Titus. These are called the pastoral epistles because Paul, actually two reasons. Paul is being pastor to two people, Timothy and Titus. We'll talk about them in a moment. And he also is instructing them on their job, their role as pastors. Timothy was a pastor of the church in Ephesus and became bishop of Ephesus. Uh, Titus was a pastor of churches and was sort of organizing the church on the island of Crete. Later became the bishop of Crete. Um, so he's both being a pastor and he's instructing them as pastors. So, so they are called the pastoral epistles. These three books um, were, and by the way, this I've shown these pictures each time of Paul. This is the representation of Timothy. This isn't Titus, this is Luke. But this is Timothy represented on, this is at the, the chapel of Lydia um, at Philippi. And so Timothy was a frequent traveler with Paul starting from his second missionary journey. We'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, you will notice that in terms of the, G, the, um, the chronological order, the last three books we believe that Paul wrote were 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Actually, we believe the order is 1st Timothy, Titus, and 2nd Timothy. That's the order we're actually going to talk about them today because 1st Timothy and Titus have a lot in common and appear to have been written at the same time because Paul is giving some of the same instruction to Timothy in Ephesus and to Titus in, on Crete, the island of Crete. And then 2nd Timothy is very different. 2nd Timothy is Paul's goodbye. Paul is in prison in Rome the second time. We believe that he is um, hes quite sure that he is going to be found guilty and executed, which he was, according to uh, tradition. And so we'll deal with them in that order, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy, and talk about uh, how all that happened. Now, this map you've seen, we've talked about all the different cities that Paul, born in Tarsus, trained in Jerusalem, converted on the way to Damascus. He lived most of his later life. His base of operations for his missionary work was Antioch. He wrote to the church in Colossae. Uh, Ephesus is actually where Timothy was. Timothy had been involved with Paul during his time in Ephesus and ended up going back to Ephesus for a longer term kind of ministry role. Uh, we've talked about Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, Rome. Um, and I've added Crete. This is the island of Crete, directly south of the Aegean Sea. On the Mediterranean Sea, all of the major sort of uh, bays or whatever you would say off of the Mediterranean each have their own names. Now, this is the Ionian Sea, this is the Aegean Sea, the Black Sea is up here. So just immediately south of the Aegean Sea is the island of Crete, where Titus was located, um, and still is. His body is there now. Uh, so that gives you kind of a picture. Again, 1 first, first Timothy, Titus, during the fourth missionary journey that we'll talk about, and then 2 Timothy, while Paul was imprisoned in Rome. Um, you'll notice the dates are 62 to 67. Now there's a lot of, um, this is not the details of the geography here in terms of where Paul was and when Paul was, are not found in the New Testament. All of this occurs after the end of the book of Acts. The book of Acts, which is of course the history of Paul, half of all of Acts is about Paul. Um, it ends with his first imprisonment in Rome somewhere around AD 62. And we don't have any other written history after that. The, the only other written indications we have are suggestions of things, like in these letters, when Paul talks about the fact that I left you on Crete, speaking to Titus, I'm going to Nicopolis, which was on the Ionian Sea on the, uh, the, the western side of the Greek peninsula, actually part of Macedonia, and so come and join me there. So the only thing we know about Paul's travels are sort of references, invitations, talking about something that's happened or where he's going to go, but we don't have the kind of record that we have in the book of Acts up until AD 62. So um, let's talk about that. This is Paul's second missionary journey was when he spent the majority of the time he spent in Ephesus. Ephesus he visited at least twice, perhaps three times. Um, he spent almost three years at one point. He spent more time in Ephesus than anywhere else. That is where Timothy was pastor and later became bishop. In fact, Timothy was martyred in Ephesus late in the first century, we believe around AD 97, um, when he, as bishop, at 80 years old, apparently there was a procession occurring through the main part of Ephesus um, 
praising and worshiping Diana, you know, the, the Roman goddess. And the, the tradition is that Timothy went out and tried to interfere with this procession of worship to Diana by preaching the gospel, and the crowd beat him and dragged him through the city and stoned him to death. So he was, uh, Timothy was martyred at age 80. Again, this is traditional. Now, we had a lot of other um, early Christian writers and leaders in that part, this western part of the Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey. Um, St. John was there up until his death, which would have been around the same time as Timothy. Plus you have people like Polycarp, who had been a direct a direct student and disciple of St. John, who also knew Timothy. And so we have a long tradition of other writers, not biblical, but other Christian writers telling us about these events happening in that part of the world. So we are not without record. We, this isn't just somebody, something somebody made up. People who are alive at that time have written records of these things. So Ephesus, Crete, the two locations that we're talking about here. Now, the real key to understanding this is the fourth missionary journey of Paul, or some people call it the fifth missionary journey of Paul. The reason being, Paul, of course, had three missionary journeys throughout Asia Minor and the, in Greece, Macedonia, the Europe. The fourth journey he took was when he was arrested in Jerusalem, taken to Caesarea Maritima, which is the Roman center, and he was there for over two years. Then he was taken to Rome by boat. Some people call that his fourth missionary journey. Some people just say that was his trip to Rome when he was, he was captive. He was in Rome for two years under house arrest. He was teaching and preaching and people were visiting him there. While he's under house arrest in Rome is where Acts ends. The very strong tradition is that Paul, though, was not found, was not uh, convicted, not executed during that first stay in Rome that around AD 62 or 63 that he was released and he fulfilled his plan, which he tells us about in the book of Romans and elsewhere, his plan to go to Spain. He had written two references to the fact he wants to go to Spain, which was part of the Roman Empire as well. And in fact, the tradition is that he went further even than Spain. He went to Britannia, which was the Roman province in Great Britain. So this is based upon what Paul writes in these pastoral epistles and some of the testimony of tradition that we have, it is not clearly delineated in Acts. But the idea is, and again, this calls it the fifth missionary journey because whoever did this map considered the trip to Rome a fourth missionary journey because he did preach when he got to Rome. Some, uh, sometimes they will call this the fourth missionary journey, and considering the trip to Rome being him being taken to prison. You know, that, that wasn't intended to be a missionary journey. He didn't necessarily volunteer for that. So this, whether you call it the fourth or fifth missionary journey, around AD 63, he was released from Rome, and again, piecing this together from, from various things, he traveled to Crete. We read in Titus about Paul talking to Titus about when I was with you on Crete, and I, had, I instructed you to stay on Crete in order to complete the work that we had started. Apparently, what, was, what had happened is, Titus was on Crete already, and Crete, the culture in Crete would remind us probably of the culture in Corinth. Remember when we talked in the Corinthian letters that the people there were terribly immoral, that there was so much of an, a societal push toward immorality. Well, the, the Cretans were apparently exactly the same way. In fact, in the, the letter from Titus, or to Titus, Paul quotes a Cretan philosopher called uh, Epimenides, who says all Cretans are liars and beasts. And that was said by a Cretan. In fact, there's interesting philosophy studies that statement because Paul says, you know, he says that all Cretans are liars and that's the truth. It, it was said by one of their own and that's the truth. Well, the question is, if all Cretans are liars and a Cretan said that, then does that right. mean all Cretans aren't liars? It's called the uh, Epimenides Paradox. And it actually is a case study that they examined in logic classes. Okay. The Epimenides Paradox, found in the letter of Titus. So Paul apparently, when he got to Crete, Titus was there, and Titus had been evangelizing. There were Christian believers, but it was apparently in complete shambles. They didn't have elders. They didn't have deacons. The church was not organized. They, Titus probably was stretched too thin. Titus is very well thought of in Scripture. He's not like he was an incompetent. Paul entrusted him with a lot of different uh, projects and and trips 
when Paul really needed somebody he could trust, Titus was one of those people that he looked to. Now, Titus is not mentioned in the book of Acts, but he is mentioned in Galatians. Apparently, when Paul went from, um, from Antioch with Barnabas, and then Peter joined him, they went down to Jerusalem to argue for the conversion of the Gentiles, Titus went along. Titus was a Gentile. Okay, Titus was not Jewish. And he went along. So he was part of the Jerusalem Council. And in fact, he was sort of the case study. He was the example. Here you have a Gentile who is not circumcised because Paul insisted that Titus not have to be circumcised because he wasn't Jewish. And he loves Jesus. Tell him, Titus. You know, and so they had this sort of show and tell with Titus as the example. Later on, Titus went to Corinth to carry probably uh, what's called the stern letter, the third letter uh, that he had written to, to the Corinthians. Um, he later on was visited in several places, so Titus was very much trusted by Paul. And then Titus brought back message, the message of how the, uh, the Corinthians had responded. Paul went to Troas to meet Titus, and he didn't show up, so he crossed over to Macedonia, and there he met Titus, and Titus gave him the report. So Titus was very involved in Paul's ministry, even though he's not mentioned in Acts. He is mentioned several times in other places. So he's on Crete. He's, been, he's evangelized, Titus has. People have come to the faith, but they're not organized. They don't really know how to worship. They don't have elders. There's no leadership. So for a period of time, apparently, Paul and Titus traveled around the island, and in each of the various congregations that they came to, they guided the people in electing elders. Now, once the elders were elected, Paul and Titus laid on hands. But it's clear from the way that it's written, not only here, but elsewhere in terms of Paul and Barnabas, for instance, the churches they went to. Paul and Barnabas just didn't walk into a congregation and say, okay, you, 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 and you are elders. They had the congregation go through a process whereby they elected elders, and then Paul and Barnabas, or later Paul and Titus in this case, would lay hands on those elders and ordain them for that ministry. And so while Paul had been on Crete, they, Paul and Titus had been traveling the island to various Christian congregations that it appears that Titus had been responsible for planting, and organizing them, electing elders, electing deacons, Paul and Titus laying hands on them and blessing them and ordaining them, but Paul left before that job was done. And so he says in the book of Titus, I left you behind to complete the task we began. So that Titus could continue doing what he and Paul had been doing. And from there, uh, Paul went up. Now this map has him going to Nicopolis. It appears as though the book of Titus was written from somewhere else in Macedonia. And you'll, you'll see Macedonia here. All of this area up here, above, from here up, is considered Macedonia at that time. It, it indicates that, come and join me when I get to Nicopolis. So the suggestion is the letter was written from somewhere before Paul got to Nicopolis, because he tells Titus, stay where you are until um, two other guys that he was sitting along, Artemis and uh, Tychemus, the guy's name starts with a T, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, when they show up and relieve you, then I want you to come and join me in Nicopolis. From Nicopolis, Paul then, it appears, traveled here, and you'll notice it says, to Spain. You may not notice it, maybe when you read it. And then we cut here, because there's a big gap. Spain is like over here, all right? Um, he travels here, visits Spain, and again, this takes the, the uh, viewpoint that he then circled the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and came up to Britain, and then came back again, and came back to Rome, where he was rearrested, tried, and eventually executed. So the belief is, based upon what's inherent in these letters, that Paul wrote the letter to <coughs> Titus somewhere after he left Crete, um, and then probably 1 Timothy, and then Titus was written from there. 2 Timothy was written from, him, from his imprisonment in Rome. So all of this happens after the end of Acts. We do not have a biblical, a strict biblical accounting of Paul's travels as we do everything prior to his first Roman imprisonment. Is that clear? You got that? No. <laughs> Help me with this. Okay. Help me with this. Okay. I can understand. I can see in Titus where it would be uh, possible, you know, that he went to Crete and he, he did go to Nicopolis and wrote the letter and that sort of thing. But you refer to strong tradition that he went to Spain and up near 
right. get written and so on. Do you have any citations for that? I, I, I don't have any with me. But again, a lot of the, some of the early writers, we know he intended to go, and some of the early writers, um, the early church fathers, the apostolic fathers and the early church fathers talk about the fact he visited Spain. And there is tradition in Spain that Paul came here. Uh, but it's not in scripture. I can bring you some references. There are, there are again, the reason that's accepted as tradition in the church is because that tradition, there are authors that say this was the case. Um, so, but it's not, it's not in scripture. It, it also, one of the reasons why First and Second Timothy and Titus have been questioned, they are the most questioned in terms of being Pauline authorship of all of Paul's writings. There are six letters that, that people, more liberal scholars, say they don't think Paul wrote them. These three are more accused of that than any. And the, one of the reasons is it's very difficult for them to figure out how this fits in. It all happens after the historical record of Paul's travels as we have it in the book of Acts. And so we piece this together based upon, we know Paul's intention, there is strong tradition that these things happen, but we don't have any other author that says, okay, when Paul left Rome, he then sailed in between, you know, the toe of Italy and Sicily, and then he went to, and then he went to, and then he went to. We're taking a lot of this from these letters themselves. Okay, wouldn't, but wouldn't, excuse me, wouldn't the, uh, the assumption that... Pam's had her hand up, too. Go ahead. You can finish. Go ahead. Wouldn't the assumption that if, if Paul did not write this, because we cannot understand, you know, that, that argument. Yeah. That had to make this whole thing fraudulent because he opens up with Paul. Exactly. Paul, a servant of God. So it means they're not, not they're not canon, if that's true. Now, let me say now I'll come right back to you, Pam. Sorry, let me go let me respond to this. The thing that um, they also say there's some things in here that don't don't sound Pauline, that don't seem to agree. For instance, in First Timothy, his very strong uh, stricture that women should not speak in the church. Okay, the other places where Paul um, mentions that there's a, the passage in 1 Corinthians 14 frequently is mistranslated, and there are a number of evangelical scholars that believe somebody may have stuck that piece in later. Okay, that that one phrase. I want people. Uh, the way it's sometimes translated is women should be silent in church. A better translation is women should be calm in the church, and the idea was that in Corinth. There were women who had come into the church who were being very, very uh, disruptive. But some scholars, evangelical scholars, people who really hold the scriptures being, as being valid, believe that may have been uh, a gloss. A gloss is an addition that was made. That, that for the sake of trying to defend that you know, women were being a problem and they, they wanted them to stop being a problem, they wanted to be able to quote Paul as saying, you guys need to be quiet. Now, I don't have a huge problem with that. Because we're not saying that... that it would be a huge problem if we said Paul was wrong, or that Paul didn't write the letters that said he wrote them. Now, the the fact that he and I'm going to talk about the Paul and women in a little bit. You know, well, that's going to be part of my talk today. But that's a you know there are some a few things in these letters, these pastoral epistles, that people say don't seem to be consistent. Actually, they're not inconsistent. Part of it is, like 2 Timothy, Paul is in prison getting ready to die, you know? That probably, you take on a whole different set of understandings when, when that's the case. Because Paul was still human, even though he spoke, you know, scripture. Okay, Pam. Um, I'm just curious, since Paul seems to travel to established churches, there's no proof whatsoever that there were any churches established in Spain or Great Britain? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I would have to look. Again, the tradition exists there. There were there were Christian churches early in Spain. In fact, so early. Um, up here is uh, Santiago de Compostela, which is, um, the belief is, that church was actually planted by St. James the Greater, who was the first apostle to die, which means... <coughs> After he got saved by Jesus and Jesus died and was resurrected, Paul would have had to gotten on a very fast boat to get to this part of Spain, plant this church, and then get back again so that he could be beheaded. Okay, because that's how he was killed. And he was the first martyr uh, of the apostles. Stephen was the first Christian martyr, but the first martyred apostle was St. James. Well, they had a church there, and this is in the northwestern corner of, of Spain, 
That's the second most prom the most popular uh, site of uh, pilgrimages in, Christ in Christendom after Rome. So it's always been seen as a holy site. So very early on, they did have churches in Spain. Well, in the same way that the people up here claim that it was St. James the Greater, St. James the Less is Jesus' half-brother, the idea was the church was there very early. Well, likewise, over here, there are churches very early, and some, many of them attribute their having been founded by Paul. But we don't have, you know, they didn't take photographs of the original church fathers and Paul, you know, with their arms around each other. We don't have undeniable records. It is tradition. And I, I'm not blowing wind at you when I tell you that we don't have absolute proof of this. But we have enough references from Polycarp and Origen and some of the early fathers that Paul did visit Spain and some references that he went as far as Britain and that's why I qualify that and say you know that's that's not as well attested um, that and there's nothing about this we shouldn't have any heartburn about this because there's nothing about this that that doctrinally is going to mess it us up it's not like he went to Spain and declared Jesus wasn't really divine or anything like that um, the issue of this being the, potentially the last trip of Paul helps us explain some things like what Paul is talking about and when he wrote these pastoral epistles and what he's talking about in them. This is a good explanation for that and it is consistent with the tradition and there's nothing about it that creates heartburn, should create heartburn for us in terms of our biblical beliefs. It's not like this contradicts something else that's in the New Testament. Fair? Okay. <coughs> And if we, if we find out when we get to heaven that it didn't really happen that way, well, that would be fun to learn. Okay? I'm just wondering what sort of age Paul would be at the time of this journey. Um, he would have been 60-ish. So getting older and um, possibly not having a scribe? Well, he, probably, he had people who traveled with him all the time. He mentions, in fact, in 2 Timothy particularly, that everyone has deserted him. But then he mentions the fact that uh, um, Onesiphorus had continued. In fact, he came to Rome looking for him and continued looking until he found him. And he'd been very gracious to him, caring for him. He lists three or four other people that had deserted him. <coughs> Apparently, when Paul was in Rome and it was not looking too good for him. And he says, no one stood up in my defense in my first trial. Um, then... A lot of them were running for cover because this was during the persecution of Nero in Rome when, when Nero was persecuting uh, severe. <laughs> severe persecution of believers. Yeah. And so the indication is they were all ducking for cover or running for it. But we even then we have the example of uh, Onesiphorus who did, was loyal to Paul and did care for him. And so the indication is he probably still had someone who was his scribe who was writing things down. The indication also is that if Paul's eyes were as bad as they seem to be from other things, that he probably wouldn't have written these letters if someone had not been assisting him with that. Okay? But again, that's all surmising. But it's it's surmising things that are not problematic in terms of our belief in scripture or, or of our theology. So I don't have a problem with that. They're good good understandings and good explanations. And there is some traditional support for that. Okay? Um, did somebody else raise their hand? That's okay. It happens all the time. Did someone else have something? Oh, yes, yes, Pam. Um, you mentioned that Titus is buried on Crete. Yes. And that's a for sure you can go and actually see. You can see his skull. Skull. Uh, I've done it. Um, they actually have this gold, looks like a golden football. And there's a hole in the top of it. And through that hole, you can see the top of Titus' skull. And he, uh, in fact, when the, in the 800s, when the Saracens, the Muslims, were threatening to overtake Crete, and did for a little while, they took the skull of Titus to St. Mark's in Venice um, and kept it there until 1966, at which time they returned it. So, you know, there's a long history of that, um, that attribution. Let me make sure. Sorry. Um, so yes, they, they, his his body was um, was buried in one of the towns in Crete, and then his, his skull, like I say, was taken to St. Mark's in Venice and then brought back later. How did he die? Um, I believe Titus. He's called a martyr of the church, but I don't know that story. Both of them are listed as martyrs of the church. Um, that would be one I'll have to look up. 
Okay? Um, so, this is where the time period and where we believe that the letters were written. Yes? What I do have a heartburn with is uh, those <laughs> scholars, those scholars, and I respect their knowledge, mm -hmm. but uh, that say that Bob Paul could not have written first and second Timothy and Titus because this thing is not typical of Paul. Yeah. Well, in I don't the epistles, uh, he's talking to a whole church, to a whole number of churches. In this case, it's a personal. It has to be the truth. I, I write different letters to different people, and I don't sound the same. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we all have a telephone voice. Uh, there, there's another group of um, evangelical scholars that are teaching in seminary right now that there is no such a thing as the birch, birch and bird. Okay, they're not evangelical scholars if they say that. They, well, they may be scholars, that's, but they're that's, not that's evangelical That's my hard scholars. work. Okay. And they are practice, by the way. Well, then they're not evangelicals. Oh, just kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, um, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah. They cannot be evangelical if they are saying that. I agree. And, uh, but, but to say that we're doubting about the tricks of Paul, all that is periphery stuff. Yeah. It's, well, again, the, the, there are both chronology questions about these letters. This helps us to understand that, and again, it's consistent, internally consistent with these letters. But then there are some content issues that we do have to scratch our head a little bit and say, how, how does that fit into some of the other things? There's nothing that's contradictory, no. and in fact, in many cases, because Paul does write to specific circumstances, in this case to specific people and specific circumstances, because part of 1 Timothy, for instance, is intended for Timothy personally, and part of it is intended for the church. So he is addressing the needs of the church as well, and it may be that in Ephesus, you remember Ephesus was the site of the worship of Artemis, lots of, lots of pagan uh, cult worship there. It may have been that there, as in the case of Corinth, if Paul did write that phrase in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, about women being calm in the church, it may have been likewise that they were having real problems. One of the things too is in that period of time, um, women, it was very infrequently the case that women were educated. Women tended not to be well educated. Uh, many of them, most women would not have been literate. And so if there were women that were creating a ruckus, the likelihood is they were not well trained. They, had not, they were not scholarly. I'm going to get into the women's thing. Now, Paul, in other places, lifts women up as prophets, uh, prophetesses. He lifts them up as deacons. He acknowledges them as deacons. And whereas in 1 Timothy, if you read it um, as being a universal statement, he says women can't be deacons. And yet elsewhere, he, he praises Junia as being a deacon of the church. <clears throat> and so there seems to be an inconsistency. One explanation would be that there was a specific set of problems having to do with women creating kerfuffles in the church, problems in the church, in Ephesus the same way they had been in Corinth. And so Paul is writing to Timothy and he is saying, okay, we got to cut through this, we got to resolve this issue, women need to be quiet in the church, I don't want women taking charge and authority over men. That doesn't mean necessarily that was going to be the case everywhere, because there are other places where Paul seems to indicate quite the contrary with regard to his opinion toward women in, in, in leadership. Okay. Maybe the, the women in uh, uh, Corinth were rowdy. Yeah, well, there's a strong indication because of the, you know, the, the cult of Aphrodite there, uh, the women prostitutes, the immorality that existed, that there were, there were problems there. Okay, I'm, I've gotten kind of ahead of us because I want to talk about the whole... Uh, Paul's attitude toward women, his, his understanding, or our understanding of his, of his teaching about women in a few minutes. But this is kind of our background to it, this idea of Paul's travels. Now let's start out looking at the book of 1 Timothy. I'm going to do this 1 Timothy and Titus because they are close, they are more similar to each other and were written about the same time, and then 2 Timothy, even though that's not the order they're in our scripture, all right? I believe it was the Apostle Paul. I believe all the claims to the contrary are... are inadequate in their argument, and you would have to have a compelling argument to claim it wasn't written by Paul because in, internal to the document is the statement that Paul is writing this. 
So if you're going to deny that, you better have a good reason. And I don't think the reasons are anywhere near sufficient to support that. And more and more scholars today. It's like we went through this cycle where the tradition on the Pauline letters was very clear. And then we hit the middle 1800s and the Germans. Thank you, Germans. Bob, the Germans. <laughs> um, and because they were looking for some excuse not to accept stuff, they began to come up with excuses for why this wasn't for instance, and one of the problems, that these were not Pauline letters. That continued into the 20th century, but the late 20th century, more and more top great scholars came back and said, you know, a lot of the arguments against the Pauline authorship simply don't hold water. They, they, they don't work anymore. And so we think we need to revisit this whole thing, and our conclusion is that the greatest likelihood is that these are Paul's letters. Okay, let's just, let's just settle there. We believe they were written sometime 62 to 66, which would be the period after, or you could say, you know, it's circa, so it could be 63 to 67, but between Paul's two imprisonments in Rome, basically. The theme is sound doctrine and godliness as best ministry, uh, as the best ministry approach against false teaching and apostasy. We'll, we'll look at that in more detail. We're going to look at the outline. Uh, but Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him personally. He is also giving instructions to the church as a whole, but he, in addition, is talking about some false teachers that have come along. It appears as though those were nascent Gnostics. Nascent means like nascimento, the birth. Nascent Gnostics would mean early Gnostics, the, the very start of Gnosticism. Um, there, there was a, a group of Christians that at the end of the first century and into the second century were Christian Gnostics. And they, they, some of the things they said was, you can't eat meat and you have to be celibate. Well, Paul refers in this letter to people who, who say that you can't be married and people who say that certain foods uh, can't be eaten. That's very consistent with the, the nascent Gnostic Christians of that time period. So he's talking about that false teaching and apostasy. It's to provide a guide for the church organization to Timothy, young pastor in Ephesus. Like I say, this sort of goes back and forth between Paul writing specifically to Timothy and his needs versus writing to the needs of the church. So, and it's full of charges, it's full of specific instructions. That's one of the reasons the pastoral epistles are so often quoted. You know, there's a lot, as you read through this, you probably kept coming across things that you, you recognized. The pastoral epistles, because they're very matter of fact about, this is what you need to do. People quote them a lot because the instructions are very clear in these, in terms of how you're supposed to approach it. Um, so let's look at an actual outline of 1 Timothy. Paul starts with a greeting, a warning against false teachers. He, um, there was some, uh, apparently, some Judaizers involved in this whole process of, in the pastoral letters as well, because he talks about the nature of the heresy. He says these people wanted to be teachers of the law, and meaning that they were um, Jewish Christians who wanted to re-emphasize the law, and therefore it appears there were some of the same kind of people that created the problem for Galatians, which is the first letter Paul wrote. Some people say Thessalonians. I don't think so. I think Galatians. One of the very first problems that Paul dealt with were the Judaizers, or Ebionites is the, is the historical church history name for them. They're the ones that said you have to become a Jew. And so here he talks about the fact that the heresy involves that these people want to be teachers of the law, and so they're trying to enforce law on people who are now Christian believers. And he then talks about the purpose of the law. In effect, what he says is the law, and here he's talking about the moral law, not the priestly law. Remember, there's two different aspects of the Old Testament law. There is the moral law, which we are still obligated to. It's still true that we shouldn't kill or commit adultery or lie on our neighbors or steal, those things, right? And so when, he, when he's talking about this, he actually gives a list at, um, in 1, 8 to 11, all the different things that people do in violation of the law. Well, they're all moral issues. He doesn't say they violate the Sabbath. He doesn't say, you know, they refuse to be circumcised. He doesn't say... For heaven's sake, they're eating bacon. He talks about sexual immorality and lying and stealing and that sort of thing. So those are all moral issues. But he talks about it as though the law still is a guide for us. 
He is not contradicting himself. This is one of the things that, that liberal scholars are claiming is, well, Paul is holding up the law now, and yet Paul was against the law. Paul never was against the law as a guide. His point was that the law will not save you. And he doesn't say that here. He just gives us an indication that the law is there for us to understand. You know, God wrote the law. And so this gives us a guide for what God's desire for us and how we're supposed to live. He then talks about how God has blessed him so much while he was yet a sinner, the worst of sinners, that God had blessed him and saved him as an example. And so he talks about the Lord's grace to him. Oh, I mentioned it kind of myself. Um, he then, let's just look at all of it. Then he begins some specific instruction to Timothy, and he refers to Timothy as my son. Both Timothy and Titus held a very special place in Paul's heart. Timothy had been with him since the start of his second missionary journey. Timothy was in, uh, lived in the city of Lystra. His mother and his grandmother were both Jewish Christians. His father was a Gentile, a Greek, as he's called. And we, we read about this in Acts. Timothy, it appears, was converted under Paul's ministry very young and began to travel with Paul and Silas on this second missionary journey as they then traveled east. Timothy comes up, he's mentioned either six or seven times in the book of Acts. He is actively involved in ministry. You saw the, the image of him in Philippi. He traveled with him to Macedonia. Um, and so he was a very important part of this. And then in this letter, he refers again, uh, and, and in 2 Timothy, to his mother and his grandmother, and he's reminiscing about uh, the fact that he was raised as a, you know, by a Christian mother and a Christian grandmother and came to the faith and has been his like his son, like Paul's son ever since then. Now, interesting comparison between Timothy and Titus. Timothy's mother was Jewish, which means technically Timothy was Jewish. His father was not Jewish, but if you're born to a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, you're Jewish. Timothy had never been circumcised, apparently because his Gentile father wasn't keen on the idea. Paul, at one point, has Timothy circumcised while they're on their travels together. And the reason he does it is not because Timothy needed it, but because Timothy would not have been welcome in the Jewish synagogues. He would not have been listened to by the Jews that they were trying to convert if he had been an uncircumcised Jew. It was purely, it was not because he needed it for salvation. It was purely a matter of it was effective for his ministry as a Jewish Christian. Titus, on the other hand, was a Gentile. And at one point, the Judaizers are saying, if Titus is going to be a Christian minister, he needs to be circumcised. And Paul says, absolutely not. He's not a Jew. Therefore, he, there was no, he wasn't going to be going in synagogues anyway. He was not going to be somebody the Jews were going to listen to. That was not going to be his ministry. His ministry was going to be just to the Gentiles. And because he didn't need it, and it was not going to be effective for his evangelism or his ministry, Paul said, no. Titus is not going to be circumcised. And that gives us an understanding of, you know, a lot of what Paul says that people say, well, it sounds like he's being a little, a little more legal, you know, a little more law-oriented. Paul said, I become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. So Paul felt like if being circumcised would make Timothy a more effective Jewish Christian evangelist, he had him circumcised. Titus, no, because that wasn't going to be an issue for Titus. Got that? Does that make sense? And those are the two people we're talking about in these letters. We then have the instruction on church administration, or basically on how the church is supposed to be structured, and also worship. He talks about public worship. He talks about prayer in public worship, that I would have all men lift hands in holy worship, and then he talks about women in public worship. Now I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Um, let me find my notes here on this. And I want to read the passage and talk about Paul more specifically about Paul and women. Okay? If you turn, if you have your Bibles, and turn to um, 1 Timothy 2, and start with 9. Well, I'll start with 8, because he talks about prayer and public worship. And this is what, according to this is the NIV. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So if anybody ever has heartburn over someone lifting their hands in worship or in prayer, Paul said to do it. He didn't say you have to do it. 
He continues in verse 9, I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate higher styles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Ephesus was a wealthy city at this time. And women there would want to show off their wealth. If you, if you ever visit Ephesus and wonder if it was a wealthy city, take the tour of the terrace houses, they're called. Um, just as you, as you walk down, you know, there's, there's two entrances. There's a sort of southern entrance and a northern entrance. Most people come in from the north. And you walk down the Curete Street, the main street. And as you get toward the bottom, you have the Celsus Library, with this, that famous photograph library. On the left, they have, begun, well, they're well into it, but they, are, um, they have an archaeological dig of the houses people lived in. And these things are absolutely opulent. They had running water in their houses. They had toilets, flush toilets. They had beautiful murals and paintings. Every room has, has painted murals. Every floor has mosaics, and some of these mosaics are spectacular. These people have a lot of money, and they like to show it. Um, you can tell which, which room was the kitchen because they have food painted on the walls. You know, fish and, and uh, turkeys and chicken and bread and all kinds of stuff. Just like people buy little tiles to put in their kitchen of various fruits and things. Um, and so they were very wealthy, and it's, it, there's every indication that the Ephesians, including the Ephesians women, Ephesian women, like to show off their wealth. And in effect, they were showing off themselves. And Paul is saying, in the spirit of humility and decency, don't act like that. Don't cover yourselves in gold jewelry and have you know really fancy bouffant hairdos and the whole thing for women. Now, here's where we get into trouble. Or at least we, we get into uh, areas of dispute. Starting with verse 11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now that authority over a man could be translated authority over her husband, which does make a difference given the cultural realities of that time. Okay. Um, either translation is true. If you've got an NIV, you'll see that there's a footnote there that says, or her husband. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But children, uh, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. This is a hard one. The indication is, uh, I'll talk about the childbearing thing in a minute. The indication is that um, <coughs> given elsewhere what Paul says about women, there must have been some specific problem he was dealing with here, if we believe this was written by Paul, which we do now. Let me talk for a second about what Paul says about women elsewhere. We have a couple of other passages, like 1 Corinthians 14, which suggests that um, Paul does tell women they need to be calm in church. But, else, but in Romans 16, Paul praises Phoebe as a deaconess. He praises Junia, who's described by Paul as being respected among the apostles. And the way it's written, that it can almost be translated that Junia was considered an apostle. You know, there were um, Barnabas in one place is identified as an apostle. St. James the Less, the head of the Jerusalem Council, is referred to as an apostle in one place. And so, apostle wasn't limited just to the twelve. Obviously, Paul was included, and there were some other people. One option for translating it is that Junia, when it says she was uh, respected among the apostles, it could have been, it could be translated, she was respected as one of the apostles. Um, when 1 Corinthians 14 says women should be silent in church, that's not the best translation. To be calm in church would be a better translation. And even evangelical scholars, some of them, believe that that may be a gloss, that that one phrase may have been added, thinking that that will help us deal with a problem we're having in Corinth by the women being rowdy. Um, much of this points to the idea that Paul, when he addressed restrictions on women in worship or in leadership, was dealing with areas where there were problems related to that. He affirms the right, even the responsibility, of women to be prophets in 1 Corinthians. And prophecy is the highest of all gifts, Paul says. Now, prophecy does not mean telling the future. Prophecy means to speak for God, which is why it's the first of all of the, of the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. It means that anyone, including a woman, according to Paul, can speak the whole truth, the justice, the mercy, the righteousness of God 
as God's verbal representative. It doesn't get more important than that in terms of ministry. Any role, apostle, teacher, preacher, those, the highest level of responsibilities in the church, all of those are prophetic roles. And when Paul acknowledges women as being prophets, the clear implication is that those are the roles that they would have to fulfill. Okay? Um, and, and that's consistent with the Old Testament, by the way, I should say. There are a number of Old Testament prophets. There is Deborah, uh, the prophet Isaiah's wife, Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, Huldah, the one who interprets the book of the law when they find it when I, during Josiah's role, uh, reign, when they find the book of the law in the temple. We even have negative prophets. Um, if you were in the class yesterday, we were talking about the fact that uh, Noadia is a false prophetess who tries to give trouble to Nehemiah. The point is that in Old Testament and New Testament, we're, there is clearly the idea that women can have a prophetic role, which is the highest of all spiritual giftings. We then have, and, and one of the issues for me, because I, I seriously struggled with this when I was seminary. What do I believe about this in terms of the ordination of women, women in leadership? One of the final conclusions for me is Galatians 3.28, because it is a universal statement. We can look at some of the passages, like um, writing to Ephesus or writing to Corinth, both of which are cities we know had, you know had cults that were led by women. And if some of those women converted to Christianity, the suggestion is they came in and they felt they should be in charge of the Christian church as well, and Paul is suppressing that. Those are specific letters to specific references. But when Paul is speaking generally, meaning more universally, we have... Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Some people have said, well, that only has to do with salvation. But Paul doesn't say that. Um, so I, having really looked at this thing and looked at all the different passages that refer to that, I believe that when Paul is being restrictive of... Women in leadership is because of an environment or a situation in which they were being a problem. The same thing would have been true if, you know, if, if um, people over 6'5 had been creating problems. Maybe he would have had some admonition that you can't have really tall people in roles of leadership in the church because they're creating problems. But again, Chloe was an important member of the church in Corinth that he acknowledged as being one of the leaders. Priscilla and Aquila, two of Paul's closest friends. They're referred to seven times in the New Testament. Five of those seven times, Priscilla's name comes first. And almost always that would indicate preeminence. <clears throat> so Priscilla, it appears, was the more important teacher. They're the ones that took Apollo aside when he came up from Alexandria and taught him the truth. Uh, because he, he had the spirit, you know, he had the spirit and the energy, and he believed in Jesus, but he didn't have all the facts yet. They took him aside and te taught him. And Paul lifts Priscilla and Aquila up as being teachers, leaders in the body of faith. Phoebe is a deacon and a benefactor of Paul. In Romans 16, Paul actually lists eight other women who are active in the Christian movement, meaning in a role of leadership in the Christian faith, including Junia, who's prominent among the apostles, Mary, who's worked very hard among you, and Julia. Um, in I believe that the, the indication, if you look at the whole picture of how Paul deals with women, is that Paul, as with Jesus, affirms women in a way that nobody else in the culture at that time did. And again, when we read the stuff of Paul, we tend to compare it to how we think about you know, uh, gender relations today. When you read Paul and you realize the context that he was speaking to, you realize just how radical he was in his affirmation of women and their role in leadership. Okay. Beyond that, I can't really explain to you what all this means. The childbearing thing, there are three different explanations for what it means when it says women will be saved through childbearing. One may be, he's saying, you all need to step back and reclaim your uh, responsibilities as wives and mothers and in, the, in the family household. That you need to go back to that because you guys have wandered off from that and that's an important part. And, and you'll, you'll stabilize. You'll get things sorted out if you go back to that, you know, to that role. A second option some has been proposed that they're actually referring to um, women being saved spiritually through the birth of Jesus. 
when it says childbirth, they mean the birth of Jesus. I think that's straining it. I don't buy that one. Okay? Uh, a third option is that it refers to women being kept safe in childbirth. Because if you read it, women will be saved through childbearing. It could mean it is a physical protection as they are bearing children. That could, that could be one of the interpretations of that. I don't know. Um, this is one of the passages that liberal scholars look at and go, boy, that doesn't sound like Paul. I don't think you wrote it. Well, I think he did write it, or else we have to dismiss all of the pastoral epistles out of the Bible. And so we struggle to understand that. Someday our understanding will be better, <laughs> will be perfect. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes? I just find it interesting that almost three quarters of the New Testament is on Paul. Mm -hmm. And yet everything seems to be a little hazy. You know, his travels, and, you know, after acts, that sort of thing. Um, what he meant by the women, the comments, those sorts of things. And yet, yes, in the, in the long term, it doesn't alter our, our belief in Christ. But mm -hmm. when we're talking to other people, Right. That are not believers. And they ask these questions. But how do we come at it from, we can't say, well, that shouldn't matter because it doesn't alter that. It, it, they, they just say, see, proof that, that this well, first, is Well, first, Paul didn't write three quarters or two, whatever, he, less than half, because the longest books are written by Luke and others, okay? Just, just so we're clear. Okay. In terms of, the amount that we're very clear about Paul, his travels, again, he made five journeys. It's only the last one we don't know about. So we've got the vast majority of his stuff we know very specifically. And even the last one, we have very clear pointers about from these letters and from other references, other writers of other people. So to say we really, you know, we really don't know about those things isn't quite true. It's just that we don't have that as part of the book of Acts. It's about the only thing you can say about it. It's not, it was not included in the other very methodical telling of Paul's story. Um, in terms of Paul's theology and his stand on things, um, the almost, the very fact that we're talking about this and that, that we're trying to, to find a, a consistency between what he says here and what he says elsewhere, um, the very fact that that's such a big deal and we talk about it so much is an example of the fact that it's an exception. The vast majority of Paul, not only his life, but the vast majority of Paul's theology is very clear and very consistent all the way through. Um, this thing that we're struggling with, because some people believe that it's so rare that Paul is not consistent or doesn't seem to be consistent or could be being inconsistent, inconsistent, is some people say they don't think Paul wrote it. That's how, you know, some of you. the consistency of Paul's writing is proven by that exception. Because it stands out like a sore thumb, because everything else is very consistent. People who, you know, people who say that Paul is not consistent in his view of homosexuality are wrong. There's at least three places where Paul is very clear about that. And there's no place where he suggests that, you know, something other. The issue with relation to women is the only area, off the top of my head I can think of, that we have some things that we're not quite sure how, how they were both written by the same person. But it's not conclusive, they're not contradictory. We just strain to figure out how they fit together. And we confess that. See, the, the, the answer to your question as to how do we say that to people is say, virtually all of this is completely consistent, and, and we don't have any problem with it. The couple of places where we do have a problem, we don't know for sure. But those very minor questions cannot overwhelm the 99.8% of the rest of it that is absolutely consistent. But he just disappears. You know, we, we, we think that he was cru crucified or whatever, but he just disappears. No, beheaded. But beheaded, The tradition is he was beheaded, yeah. <laughs> um, how did Shakespeare die? Does anybody know? I don't. Well, he lived a lot more recently than Paul did. Again, we have writers, we have tradition, we have uh, Polycarp, Origen, and others who lived, you know, at that time and later, who tell us this is what happened to Paul. The only thing we don't have is we don't have it in Scripture. Now, when I say tradition says, what that means is, this is not a biblical testimony. This is not the Word of God telling us this. 
This is other writers whose writings we do not hold to be part of divine canon. Well, we're not, we have more testimony for what happened to some of, some of the characters like Paul, what happened to them, than we do a lot of historical characters that have been much more recent than that. Okay, so uh, I don't think there's any, there's any ground for that kind of argument. I really don't. Yes? Uh, in, in response to this, correct me, correct me, feel, please. Uh, when, when, when I'm confronted with people who ask questions like that, my basis for defense comes from scripture. It doesn't come from historical text or um, tradition. Because I cannot, I cannot put my finger on that. So when I stand before someone to give a defense, it's going to come from what is written here, which I accept by faith. If they do not accept that by faith, well, that's, that mutes the argument. But it doesn't, it doesn't change where John comes from. And so my evidence is written in here. But even in this, there is this element that makes common moral man uncomfortable. It's called mystery. And, and you cannot avoid that. Christ or, or uh, Christ himself and, you know, uh, God himself. And, to the secular mind cannot be proven by empirical evidence. So there's this element of mystery. There is truth, there's fact that supports this, but there's always going to be that uncomfortable, this, you know, that, 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 that queasy feeling of mystery, because we don't like that. And there, like Ross was saying, there are just some areas that are written here that I, I, you know, I don't have an explanation for. I just don't. Right. So I'm, I, it's what the theology is about. We believe so we can understand. It. Right. You know. So I choose to believe this so that I can embark on on a discovery to understand what it means. I don't understand it like Aquinas did. Understand it so that I can believe. I believe it so that I can understand. The common man wants to understand it so he can believe. It. So that's well, what. And I, I agree with all of that. I also, and I believe that it ultimately does come down to that. It comes down to faith. The, 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 that first step is saying, I'm going to accept this on the surface, and now let me dig into it and see what happens. But the fact is, like with regard to the authenticity of Scripture, um, there is more, there is hundreds of folds more evidence for the Bible that we have being what it says it is from who who we believe wrote it at the time we believe it was written than any other document. Much more than any of the Greek writers that we hold up so much. We don't have any clue. We don't even know, for, you know, for, you look at some of the ancient Greek writings, the Homer, for instance, the Odyssey and the Iliad, the great classics. We have no clue, really, who Homer was. The legend is that he was a blind storyteller, illiterate. We don't know that. Somebody later wrote this stuff down. And yet, you don't get people looking at the Odyssey and the Iliad and saying, I don't think, we, you know, this doesn't have any value to us because we don't really even know who wrote it. It doesn't happen. And we know infinitely more about Paul than we do William Shakespeare. There are people who swear that Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare's plays, that, that William Shakespeare didn't write them. Somebody else did. And yet, that doesn't cause people to say, I'm not going to read that, that garbage because we don't even know who wrote it. Really? Does that matter at the end of the day? And so my point is, there is a tendency for people to look at Scripture and pick out the slightest possible question or concern or misunderstanding or mystery and think that that discredits everything. And nobody applies that kind of critique to any other document, which means there may be some spiritual forces at work here trying to discredit the truth of this. Okay, I want to take one question and we're going to take a break. I'm sorry. One, just Bob. Well, <clears throat> a couple of statements from Paul himself that helps me personally in this area. One is, I chose to know nothing but Christ and Him and crucified. crucified. And the other, maybe a little bit of a paraphrase, but I may not necessarily know what I believe about everything. Most of things help me more than anything. Absolutely right. Excellent. 
And the nature of these classes, because we take a fairly academic approach to these classes, is that we dig into these things. And, but we can't let the questions that we raise, and fairly, that, you know, all truth is God's truth. We're never afraid to raise ask a question. We're never afraid to say we don't understand. Just because I don't understand doesn't mean, doesn't mean that God's not in control or God doesn't understand. And yet, some of you have heard me say before, don't ever let what you don't understand, which is usually the small things, overwhelm what you do know and understand. Because as I say, the amount, the amount of Paul or any of the rest of Scripture that we look at and we're not quite sure what it means, we don't really quite understand it, you know, we're, we're a little mystified by that, are so small compared to the, to the mountains of material here that we do understand and, and is credible and does, you know, it makes our lives for us. So, okay, we're going to take a break. <laughs> One of the things I want to I wanna make sure as we conclude this part of the conversation is, I said earlier, we're not afraid of any questions. All truth is God's truth. We confess that we may not understand everything, but we're not afraid to ask the question. And when we don't understand something, we'll say, we don't really understand that. Um, the thing that gets us in trouble when we witness to other people about this is when we start either trying to pretend we know everything, or we try to make excuses. So our response is, we believe that the vast majority of all this is very consistent, and we do understand what it's saying. The very few places like this where it's a bit of a mystery, we confess it. You know, we have to have humility about it. Um, and I think people understand that. Barbara. Can I make a comment on that? Okay. Uh, in Genesis, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Yeah. I always thought of them standing together and, and uh, Adam was listening to her and the serpent talk. But when you look at Paul's interpretation that he says um, Adam was formed first then Eve and Adam was not the one deceived it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner uh, but when we'll be saved through childbearing what they're getting at is that she should have deferred to Adam rather than talk to the serpent herself well and women should defer to those in authority you know so yeah I and, think that's where you're going but again and this is one of the areas where people say it doesn't seem consistent Elsewhere, Paul identifies Adam as being the one yeah. who, who yeah. sinned, the one who fell. Here he seems to be saying something different. And again, different emphasis at different times. Both of them were, you know, both of them had failing in the process. So, but we recognize that and we admit we don't, we don't fully understand all of that. But again, don't let the, the, the very few things you don't understand or don't know overwhelm the many, many, many things you do understand and do know. We simply admit that we don't have all the answers to some of those minor things. Okay? Let's keep moving. We then have qualifications for church officers. Both, uh, this is one of the ways that 1 Timothy and Titus are together, and we say there's similarities between the two, is both of them outline the criteria or the requirements necessary for somebody to be in church leadership. Um, overseers is one of the words that's translated that the word is actually uh, translated elsewhere as elders. And so we're talking about elders and deacons here. Senior elders, um, bishops, later on overseer and bishop are two words that began to be used interchangeably in the church. But we're talking about the requirements for elders and the deacons here. And again, this is one of the other, uh, other strange things is... The, the, the suggestion that Paul didn't want to accept women in leadership, I read this as sounding as though part of his instructions, he says, deacon, about deacons, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, etc., etc. And then it says, verse 11, in the same way the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. It sounds as though he's identifying that the criteria for women to be deacons are exactly the same as for men to be deacons. Now, some people have said, no, it's talking about the, the deacon's wives. Well, it doesn't say that, actually. And so, um, again, to me, that's a testimony to the fact that at its root, Paul did not have trouble, trouble with women in, in ministry leadership. He had trouble with women who were causing problems uh, in terms of uh, being aggressive or uh, overbearing. Becky. He shows plenty of times problems with the men, too. Oh, yeah. So, 
a lot of people were trying to say, well, he's just targeting women. Well, he's targeting the men. Oh, all yeah, he's all massive. The time, too. Throughout Scripture, including Paul, if you're talking about how many problems are, are caused by women versus how many problems are caused by men, right. no question. Okay, uh, We probably wouldn't have wars if it was up to the women. Um, and then the purpose of these instructions, he goes on then, uh, he gives instructions concerning false teaching. Now I, here, he talked earlier about uh, pe people who wanted to be teachers of the law, so apparently there were Judaizers. Here he talks about those who say you cannot marry and those who say you can't eat certain foods. Well, this is, uh, it sounds very much like the heresy of incretism, which was the nascent um, Gnostic heresy. Uh, the, the people who followed it are called incretites in the early second century, so incretism. It's a, a version of Gnosticism. They claim to be Christian, but then they follow the Gnostic ideas. That is a philosophy that says um, that it's entirely what you know. Gnosis, knowledge, the Greek word. And it's, it's a matter of having the secret knowledge. There's no spiritual things, there's no morality. You can do whatever you want if you have the right knowledge. Um, it was, it's been universally decried as a heresy throughout the history of the church. And then he talks about the methods of dealing with it, and most especially the focus on scripture as being the source. He talks about remember what you've been taught, you know, use the gifts that you've been given, and study the scripture, because in scripture you will find the directions you need. He then gives instructions about various groups in the church, the old people and the young people, the widows, the elders, and slaves, and he tells slaves to respect their masters. Uh, he, he's suggesting that as Christians, part of their witness is, is based upon the fact that they are loyal workers. And again, Roman slavery was not like the slavery that we think of as being American slavery. For one thing, it wasn't racially divided. They were slaves from all different races and all different groups of people. Uh, frequently, someone, would, someone who was uh, a Roman would sell themselves into slavery for a period of time because they needed the money. Quite often, and slaves were well cared for, quite often slaves were better cared for and had fewer economic problems than somebody who was a freeman. And so that's why some of them would voluntarily become slaves. Quite often when a slave, and most slaves would be freed by the time they're 30. This was not a lifetime thing. Uh, and a slave, quite often, if they, if they reach the point of their freedom, they would voluntarily say, I don't want to be free. I feel like I'm part of your family. Because they weren't just field hands. They, were, they cared for the children. They were tutors to the children. Many of them were trained in philosophy, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was a very different kind of thing than what we understand. People who say, oh, Paul supported slavery, and they have images of, of uh, Africans with you know, with these horrendous kinds of collars and manacles and stuff. It's a completely different world. You know, those comparisons are not valid. And actually, there was an atheist group that were running billboards, quoting passages about Paul saying, slaves obey your masters, and using those kinds of images. And historically, that's completely anachronistic. Those two things don't fit together. Okay, Becky? I think he was trying to make the best out of the situation is if you are a slave, so that you are are um, more respected and you know by your master or that that even your master would have more mercy on you or let you go free you know obey and respect him and you'll get more out of it right and, and a better witness we then get into miscellaneous matters he talks about false teachers again he's sort of circling back around Love of money, there's a passage in there that all of we Western Christians in the 21st century should memorize about what, you know, what the futures, what, what it's going to look like amongst Christians. In fact, it's just too good. I have to read it to you, 635. Um, three to five. Okay. Well, six to ten is love of money. Uh, okay. Yes, sorry, I, I thought there was something wrong with that. Um, Actually, I'm thinking of, of second. Thinking of passage in second. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, because he, he talks about some of the same things. He talks about the way people will look and they will act. They will love money, you know, they'll love themselves, they, they'll be disobedient to their parents, and on and on and on. This long litany of things, which give me a description of Western civilization in the start of the 21st century, and that's it. Okay. Um, 
then charges to Timothy, and then the rich. There's a passage there where, where he talks about, uh, tell the rich to be generous with what they have, so that they may claim the life that is really life. Which is a very powerful statement to those who have money. And then a concluding appeal and benediction. So that is 1 Timothy. Um, key verses. I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. Your instructions for the church. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He, that is Jesus, appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. It's a little doxology praise uh, about the nature of Jesus. And then 1 Timothy 6, 11, and 12, But you, man of God, Timothy, remember you're a man of God. Flee from all of this, all of the, the tendencies that the world has, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So this really is, the first Timothy has directions for the church, and for Timothy as a person. Those, those two facets, all right? Um, let's talk about now the book of Titus, because it has a lot of similarity. The same period of time, we believe it was written right about the same time, maybe he sat down and wrote both these letters at the same time, we don't know for sure. There's the emphasis, the theme is emphasis on doing what is good, as well as classic summary of the Christian doctrine. As I said, the Cretans apparently had a lot of the same problems that the Corinthians did. There was a lot of immorality, there was a lot of laziness, there was not a sense of being disciplined as even those who had become Christians. The purpose is to give Titus, whom Paul had left to care for the church, they planned on a guidance in meeting opposition, instructions about faith and conduct, and warning about false teachers. And some of the similarity is he deals with the appointing of elders, and he talks about the criteria necessary for somebody to have a role of authority and leadership in the church. And he does it in terms of a reminder, because Again, Paul had been on Crete. He and Titus had been going around. Paul, when he left, left the job to Titus to do. And so he's now writing back to him, apparently fairly soon after he left Crete, reminding him, okay, remember, these are the things you need to look for. This is what's necessary for someone to be in a position of leadership. The outline, he begins with greetings. He starts right away talking about elders, reason, uh, the reason why he left Titus on Crete to finish the job of appointing elder, electing elders and ordaining them, and then he gives the qualification for elders. Then he talks about false teachers. Uh, false teachers here, he actually refers to the circumcision group. Those who are Jewish Christians who are telling people they have to be circumcised. The same problem Paul has been dealing with throughout his whole ministry since the start of his ministry with the Galatians and since the Jerusalem Council. Um, he then Along with that, he has the famous quote about uh, from Epimenides, all Cretans are liars and ugly beasts. The Epimenid, uh, Epimid, Ep Epimidean, the paradox of Epimenides. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to make that into an adjective. Okay, sorry. Um, he then goes on concerning various groups in congregations, very similar again to what he did in 1 Timothy. He gives instructions, first to the older men, men, and then the older women, then the younger men, and the slaves, once again. I, I, you do get the feeling that Paul sat down and wrote the letter to Timothy, and he said, you know, Titus has got the same problems. Let me write to him, too. And he, was, you know, he still had in his mind the same things he has, had written to Timothy, because he covers them. It's not exactly verbatim, but it's the same kind of content. Um, he then talks about the, the, oh, sorry, the foundation for Christian living, and he compares it to the Cretan immorality. Um, then he talks about the duty that Titus has in fulfilling his call. He then talks about concerning uh, believers in general, their obligations to be good citizens, to obey the ruling authorities, that, so that there would not be a cause for the officials to, to uh, think badly of them. He then talks about the motives for godly conduct. He, he says, basically, we too used to be foolish. I'm going to show you that verse in a second. That we were just as bad, and it's only by the grace of God, that, and, and uh, given through Jesus Christ, that we are now better than that. So have a little patience with the other folks. He then has um, concerning response to spiritual error, and he refers here to genealogies. 
Apparently these Judaizers, one of the things they would do is they would make huge uh, theories based <coughs> upon the genealogies of the Old Testament. And they would draw theological conclusions that, weren't, that aren't really there based upon the names that were in the genealogies. And so these myths, he calls them, based upon the genealogies, were looking at the Old Testament, and it's something that the Judaizers often did. They would create doctrine from stuff that was not supposed to be doctrinally uh, a, a doctrinal source. He then gives the, oh, that's the spiritual error, and then he gives conclusions, greetings, and benediction. Very short book, three chapters. It's the shortest of the, of the pastoral epistles. Any questions about that? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the point concerning response to spiritual error, you were talking about, could you, could you repeat that, please? You were talking about how they've got a doctrine from genealogy? Exactly. There's two places that Paul says they build up myths and pile up genealogies. The indication is that these Judaizers, these Jewish Christians, are looking back to the Old Testament and the very, you know, there are a lot of genealogies in the Old Testament. Um, Genesis 5, um, we just went through them in our, in our history classes in the Chronicles and other places where it just page after page. Well, apparently, they had been creating these sort of mythical theologies, these, these doctrines which were not true based upon those genealogies. I mean, if you like basing your doctrine on a phone book, almost. Now, there is some content in those genealogies in terms of who those people were, and as I told the, the class in Historical Books of the Old Testament, the more we learn about the stories of the Old Testament, the more meaningful those names are to us, because we can link them to events that we're told about. But a lot of them don't have any events linked to them. Um, but the one thing they do is they ground the story of the Old Testament uh, history in real history. You know, it links it to, these are real people who really lived, and they were descended, you know, down through the generations, and that's one of the reasons for it. Undoubtedly, that was to produce uh, importance and distinction and privilege, right? You know, with those who were in the genealogy. Yeah. Wow. You know that we can trace ourselves back. We don't know exactly. We do. We do know they were using those and coming up with false doctrine, because again, he refers to that twice. So, in Titus, Titus three three to eight. This is where he's talking about we too were foolish, so you know, be patient with them. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and by the way, this, that statement, this is a trustworthy saying, occurs any number of times. That's one of the themes. Paul is making these, these statements, almost aphorisms, and he prefaces them by saying, this is a trustworthy statement, like, no, pay attention, this is, this is important. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. That doing what is good. Believers can't continue to live like everybody else, especially in Corinth and on Crete, where everybody mm -hmm. thought being immoral and lazy, etc., etc., was all just the way you live. That was the goal. No, not if you're a Christian. Paul's making that very clear. Okay? Yes? What's an aphorism? An aphorism is a one-liner. Um, G.K. Chesterton, one of my heroes, is called the, you know, the king of the aphorisms because he's got all these one-line statements that are just so, they just blow you away. Like, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. Right? Things like that, that just in one sentence, there is so much content. Um, all of these quotable quote books, that's a book of aphoris aphorisms. Okay. I don't want to say one-liner because that sounds like a joke, but uh, but it's a it's a truism. Or, or it would be good on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Or Twitter. Fourteen, you know, hundred and forty hundred forty characters. Um, okay, let's look at Second Timothy now. First Timothy and Titus very similar, similar themes. You get the sense he almost wrote them together. Uh, he, dealing with heresy, talking about leadership in the church, conduct in the church, etc. Now we come to Second Timothy, a very different tone. Second Timothy is Paul's goodbye letter. This is the last letter he wrote. 
and he is in prison in Rome. We know he's in prison because he refers several times to his sufferings, to his chains, to various other expressions that indicate that he is now back in prison. Um, and he knows that his work is done, his time is short, he's writing to one of the people he was closest to, his beloved Timothy, who he calls my son. He, and he, he asks him to come and visit him. Um, not because he wants him to be in prison with him, but because he wanted Timothy, the comfort of Timothy. Because in this letter, he talks about the people, he says generally, everyone has deserted me, although he speaks positively of uh, Onesiphorus, but he actually names the names of some people who deserted him. And uh, it, the indication was they actually began to oppose him after having been disciples of his. So the purpose is to ask Timothy to come to him in Rome, to admonish Timothy to guard and maintain the gospel during Nero's persecution, and to communicate with the church in Ephesus. Once again, it's both to Timothy as a person and it's to the church that exists in Ephesus, just like 1 Timothy. Now, one of the things is, um, it appeared, while they had some persecution in the areas, at this period of time in the middle of the first century, late middle, we we're talking about the 60s AD, um, Nero's persecution was limited to Rome. What happened was, Rome had burned down two-thirds of the city had burned down, and the rumor was that Nero had burned it down because he wanted to rebuild it the way he wanted it. There really is no historical support for that. In fact, there are historians from that time that seem to indicate that Nero was getting a raw deal. And no matter what he said or what he did, no matter how he tried to change people's opinion, they it got more and more, people became more and more convinced that Nero had burned down the city. And he was getting less and less popular, like he was ever very popular. Um, and so Nero decided what he had to do was find a scapegoat. He had to find somebody else to blame it on. And he picked the Christians because the Christians were very unpopular. Why were the Christians unpopular? Because the Christians didn't go along with anything else. They didn't go along with emperor worship. And what that meant was whenever you went out to any social event, if you went to a, you know, to a soccer game or whatever you went to, they would start out by dedicating it to the gods. If you went to somebody's house for dinner, they would start out by offering libations to the gods. Everywhere you went, there was pagan worship. Well, the Christians wouldn't do that, and so that means that the Christians were kind of pretty much unplugged from social life in Rome. And so therefore, nobody liked them, and everybody thought there must, they must be doing something awful because they won't hang around with us. They won't come to the club with us. They won't play cards with us. They won't do anything with us. The reason is because the pagan worship was so embedded in everything else, Christians were, were not willing to do that. Well, when Nero needed somebody to blame, he picked the Christians because they were not popular. They were one group that, by, by their own choice, had kind of set themselves apart, didn't have strong connections or links or social relationships with anybody else in Rome. So the persecution of Nero in, right at this time, we're talking in the 60s AD, ended up not really expanding beyond that. It was only in Rome, but Paul doesn't know that at this point. His concern, as we said here, to maintain the gospel during Nero's persecution, Paul is concerned that this persecution of Christians is going to spread. But Nero's motivation was just to get the people of Rome to chill and stop blaming him for stuff. And so he was isolated to Rome. Other persecutions, major persecutions under other Roman emperors came later. But the Neronian persecution was limited almost exclusively just to the city of Rome. But he didn't know that at the time. Yes? Didn't they also, the non-Christians, believe um, that the Christians were cannibals because they had been hearing about eating the body of the Christ? They ate the body of their founder. Right. Um, they, they thought that they kidnapped children. You know, they, well, and they, they thought that, that this cannibalism occurred during this uh, a love, feast, love feast, which they talk about that you know, the Christians would get together to share a meal and take communion. And early on, they sometimes refer to that as a love feast. Well, the Romans decided these were wild orgies. And so these people were completely immoral and cannibals, and they stole children. So it wasn't very hard to, for Nero to convince them, you know, but, these are the bad guys. But you know, you know, on the other side of that, they were known, and, and, and people looked at them with a, with a, you know, a weird look because they would take care of the poor, yeah. and they would bring. And they would in take in children. They would bury people that were died on the streets and had no burial, and, and that really opened the eyes of many of, uh, of the Romans. Right. Okay. So let's look at the outline. First, an introduction. 
And it's clear all the way through this, the four chapters of this letter, that Paul is lonely. He's been deserted, he's in prison, he's, he's quite sure that he's not going to make it this time, and he's lonely. Um, he's reminiscing about some of his experiences with Timothy and remembering Timothy's mother and grandmother and the life that they've spent in terms of traveling and ministry together. He then expresses concern for Timothy. Um, and he talks about the fact that, you know, knowing that there's persecution and more coming, he said, you need to stand strong and remember that, you know, take strength in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is, does not give us a spirit of timidity, but of strength and of power. Becky, do you have something? Um, there were no other apostles in Rome at that time. Oh, okay. You know, so that, that wasn't an issue. Yeah. Now, there's no sense in which he had a break with anybody, any, any other leadership. These were people that basically had come to the faith under him and had then run off and left him when it got hard in, in Rome. And then he talks about his situation. He talks about the fact that he's been deserted by everyone. He is in prison. He gives then special instructions to Timothy. He calls for endurance under persecution, and as I told you, Timothy did confront pagan practices in Ephesus and was himself martyred at age 80 by trying to preach the gospel in, face, in, a, in front of a procession in worship of goddess Diana. So he, he did end up suffering martyrdom. Um, Paul then talks about warning about foolish controversies. He quotes two people as, being, as having spread the rumor that the resurrection has already taken place and that they'll get what's coming to them. In fact, this is the same problem that uh, the Thessalonians had suffered from. And you wonder if maybe there was not a, a group of these guys who were preaching this stuff because the Thessalonians, the whole, the second uh, book of Thessalonians was written specifically to address the question as to has Jesus already returned and we missed him. We then get warnings about the last days, the terrible times that are coming and the means of combating them. Um, and I think this is what I was thinking of. I'm going to keep trying until I find it. Second uh, Timothy 3. Here you go. Starting with the first verse of the third chapter. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, hear this and think about our, our culture today. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing, uh, have nothing to do with such people. There's so much in there. I mean, we talk about liberal scholars who claim that you know they're they're interpreting, but but they deny its power. A bad theologian is a theologian that's more concerned about what they think about Scripture than they are about Scripture, or what they think about God than they are about God. And so much of it's described right there in terms of Christians, okay? And how to combat that, especially recognizing the Scripture, and this is the powerful passage that all Scripture is God-breathed, you know, that this is the place where Paul talks about the importance of Scripture as the thing that teaches us, guides us, especially in difficult times. And then Paul's departing remarks. He charges Timothy to preach the Word. Uh, to preach and teach and make sure in the face of persecution that he preaches the word, that that's his commission. And Paul reminds him of the victory that they will, they will receive in the, in, at the final consummation after their death. And then there are final blessed greetings and benediction. And this very clearly, I mean, there's a very different tone to this letter because Paul is saying goodbye. And Paul, he's not, he's not desperate, he's not desolate. But he is grieving. He's grieving the end of his ministry. He's grieving the loss of some of his friends. He's grieving his, his pending death. He knows he's going to be executed. Um, and so you get a very different kind of tone here. Understandably so. I mean, it's not, it's not just that he, it's not like he has a fatal disease and he expects he might die. Somebody's going to kill him. He's going to be murdered for standing up for the faith. And so there's naturally a sadness in Yes. You know, he probably was uh, pretty miserable down in that pit, rather, than house arrest. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, the first time he was in Rome, he was under house arrest. We know that from the book of Acts. 
If you go to Rome today, and you can go to the, the traditional prison, again, I use that word, that's, that, that is shorthand for saying, we don't know this absolutely is true. This is one of those cases I mentioned before class started, and Earl Pastor Earl Palmer, who speaks often, he's been to Ephesus, I don't know how many dozen times, and he leads groups and tours and all that, and when he talks about things like the, the traditional Mamertine prison, it's called, in Rome, it's right off the Roman Forum, um, where both Paul and Peter at different times were held captive. And it, li it looks like an alibe. You know, there's an opening, and then it, it opens up down in there, and the prisoners would be dropped down in there, and then food and stuff would be dropped down to them. There was no sanitation facilities or anything else. That's the traditional place. Well, Earl Palmer, I started to say, whenever you hear something like that, this is the prison where Paul was kept. We can't completely deny those traditional testimonies, you know, because he was kept somewhere, and there's something that led to that tradition. But Earl always used to say, well, you hear that, and you go, well, what wonders? What yeah. wonders whether that really was where Paul stayed? We don't know. But you can visit the traditional prison, the Mamertine prison of Paul and, and Peter, again, different times, not the same time, um, and it is it is like a big alhibe, uh, is the way you think of it, with a grate over, over the, the hole that they could open up. Um, Okay, let's look at two passages from 2 Timothy as key verses. First, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. You then, my son, you hear the affection that he had for Timothy. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you ever heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Pass this on. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer, who is Jesus, of course. Meaning, don't get bogged down with the things of the world. You have a job to do. You are part of an army. And you have an assignment. And then, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy, that, so here it is, you know this stuff, I taught it to you. You know who you learned this from. That's one of the ways you deal with problems. Then, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Very famous passage. I use that all the time in classes about you know, what we believe about the Bible. So, Paul is saying goodbye. Timothy far outlived him. We do not know whether Timothy was able to go to Rome to see Paul before he died. We simply don't have that information. Even though Paul asks him to come and visit him. I'm sure if it was within his power, he probably would have tried to. But by the time Paul's letter got to Timothy in Ephesus, from Rome to Ephesus, by the time Paul or Timothy could have gotten from Ephesus back to Rome, a lot of time would have passed. Whether or not Paul had that much time before the final... His final judgment and execution, we don't know. Any questions about this or about any of the pastoral epistles? As I say, these are some of the most quoted of all of Paul's letters because there's there are so many things like all scriptures God breathed. There's so many direct instructions that, that have, you know, that a lot of punch that people often quote this stuff. Anything? Uh, first Pam and then Marvin, yes. Uh, just just clear me on this. This is when he finally dies, um, not the not that. <laughs> not he, when he died the first time. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of when that trip to Spain was. Was that the first? This time? is a, this is at the end of that. Okay. That the first the first first Timothy and Titus we believe was written um, after he leaves Rome and visits Crete. He writes him from Nicopolis or approaching Nicopolis. He then goes to Spain, maybe to Britain, comes back to Rome, and in Rome the second time, he's arrested. And after he's arrested in Rome the second time, he writes this letter. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Thanks. Martin. 2 uh, uh, Timothy 2.20, it says, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. So he does, gives us some responsibility of cleaning ourselves away from the filth and the evil in the world, you know, 
we're saved by grace, but we have a responsibility afterwards to right. And we do, and that's you know all these letters talk about we have a responsibility to, to do good and to act in a way that's moral and not like the rest of the world. Uh, and that passage, it's you know a Paul in one place refers to refers to us as jars of clay. You know we have treasures in jars of clay, meaning not valuable, not gold, not silver, but there's a treasure inside. And I think that passage where he talks about there are some implements that are gold or silver and some that are wood or clay, um, and He's saying, by our nature, we are the most common of things. And yet, as we allow ourselves to be sanctified, we can be used for sacred things. And he follows it up, you know, be the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Right. So, we can be made sacred. You know, we can go from, metaphorically speaking, from being wood and clay to being gold and silver in terms of us being used for sacred purposes. Go ahead. In the past passage, it said um, that there was the hope of eternal life. Mm -hmm. Weren't they guaranteed eternal life once they accepted Christ? Well, there's always the, the theme of hope. Of course, Paul, um, 1 Corinthians 13, we call that the love chapter, but it actually ends with, uh, and now these three abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. When we were going through this life, and Paul, for all of his suffering, you know, when in here, what he experiences, he hasn't yet experienced eternal life. He hasn't yet experienced the presence of the Lord in, in terms of other than the original experience on Damascus Road. And so that is his hope. That is the thing to which he looks forward. There's not, not a suggestion when you say the hope of eternal life. There's no suggestion in that that you might not get it. It's the thing you look forward to. I, uh, so, anything else? Great, thank you all very much. And I will see you next week. We will deal with um, the importance of Paul. We'll talk about the theological sort of an overview. And then we'll take the test and we'll all enjoy it, right? All right. All right. All right. All right.